If you spend time watching videos on YouTube by people who make things, you'll most likely have seen people using kilns and forges to heat materials up to incredibly high temperatures. Kilns, especially the digitally controlled kind, are great because they allow you to precisely heat things at specific temperatures and at different heating rates for extended periods of time. But kilns, especially store-bought ones, can be pricey or difficult to find used at a reasonable price. I've wanted a kiln for both artistic and scientific reasons for many years now, and I finally have one. From making coffee mugs out of clay to carbon fiber, graphene foams, and glass, you'll be seeing this kiln in a lot of future episodes. I wanted to make my own kiln for a few reasons. The first is the price tag. It was much cheaper to source the materials and make my own than it was to buy it, especially at the size that I built mine at. The full build came out to about $180. The other reason is so that if anything broke, I'd know how to fix it or replace it. Now, I will say this isn't the first time I've attempted to build something like this. Some of my earlier prototypes were made out of a paint bucket and were more than a little prone to explosion, so I figured if I was going to seriously build one of these again, this time I needed to do it properly. As before, I'll be using a large bucket as the housing of the kiln, but this time, instead of a small paint bucket, I'm using a large 11 gallon wash bin. One of the core parts of the kiln is the lining that helps contain the heat. This is known as the refractory material. It obviously needs to be heat resistant, and it needs to keep everything well insulated. Ideally, you want to use something like fire brick, but since fire brick can be expensive and the point of the build is to keep the cost down, I'll be making my own refractory. The recipe that I'm using is based on one that I first saw Nighthawk and Light make for his soup can forge. It works really well and the starting materials are nice and cheap, which is ideal. All we need is 50 pounds of plaster of Paris and 50 pounds of sand and some water. The easiest way I found to do this was to use a measuring bucket so I could carefully control my proportions. I added one bucket of sand and one bucket of plaster to the large tub and then mixed it by hand until completely homogeneous. Then I'd add another bucket of sand and another bucket of plaster and continue mixing. This way everything is sufficiently mixed so there's no pockets of just sand or plaster that would interfere with this setting properly. In the end, I used four buckets of plaster and three buckets of sand so I had a little bit extra plaster so everything was guaranteed to hold together. Once everything was mixed, I removed about half of the powder and kept it in a separate bin temporarily to make adding water easier. Using the same measuring bucket as before, I added one bucket of water to the mix that was still remaining in the tub. I mixed this as thoroughly as possible before adding the rest of the powder, and then a second bucket of water. Again, this was mixed well. Before it has a chance to start setting, I placed a bucket into the wet mixture and used a heavy toolbox to help sink it into the mix and hold it there. I first saw Grant Thompson over at the King of Random do this, and I thought it was a great idea. Once the mixture is set, you can remove the bucket to leave a nicely formed area that'll be the interior of the kiln. However, if you're going to do this, get a bucket that's more flexible. Mine just shattered and was a nightmare to remove. When the bucket is removed, we can start to carve out our grooves for our heating element. The element itself is going to be a 1500 watt coil made of canthal wire. The coil comes in a compressed form and needs to be stretched evenly before use. If it's not even, you'll get places that are hotter and colder on the coil. To carve the grooves, I'm just using some pottery tools. I first marked out where I want the grooves, and then carefully hollowed them out. Luckily, there's still a lot of water left in the plaster, so it's pretty easy to carve. Try and make sure that all of the grooves are evenly spaced. This will help prevent uneven heating in the kiln later. I'm using my heating element as a tester to make sure that everything is going to fit properly and to make sure that the element won't fall out. Be sure to clean out all the dust when this is done and everything fits. To connect the electronics to the heating element, I picked up these ceramic terminal blocks. After deciding where I want to put both ends of the heating element, I carved out little spaces for these so they aren't protruding in the kiln. For the lower terminal block, I had to drill a hole through the side of the tub so I could run the wire that will attach here. To actually control our kiln, we'll be using something called a PID and a solid state relay. With the help of a thermocouple that we'll install later, the PID measures the temperature inside the kiln, and if it's too low, sends power to the relay. The relay then allows the full current from a wall outlet to flow into the coil. When the kiln hits the correct temperature, the PID stops sending power to the relay, and no more power goes to the coil. This repeats as often as is needed to keep the temperature where you set it. To house my PID and the relay, I built a little box out of some scrap wood and attached it to the side of the kiln. I'm not worried about it burning because there's a large amount of insulation between the core of the kiln and it. These screws will also come in handy later. I drilled a second hole in the side of the tub so that the thermocouple can sit at the bottom of the kiln. 
I chose the bottom because that's where I care about the temperature the most, but after filming this and running some tests, I've decided I want it higher up to get a more accurate reading. So try and install it halfway to two thirds of the way up the kiln. The thermocouple that comes with the PID can work up to 450 degrees Celsius, so I only used it to get a feel for how things fit together. I switched it out for a proper high temperature kiln thermocouple later on. For this type of kiln, you want a K-type thermocouple rated up to the maximum temperature you want the kiln to get to. I want as wide of a functional range as possible, so I went with one that can withstand up to 1300 degrees Celsius. The new thermocouple was first connected to the little base plate thing that it comes with, and then put into place. When I drilled the hole, I made it so that the ceramic insulators of the covering of the thermocouple would sort of pressure fit in and hold the thermocouple in place once it's in position. Then the wiring can be connected, making sure to connect the correct wire to the correct side of the thermocouple. It has a distinct positive and negative, so make sure it's not backwards. At first, I mounted the relay on the side of the box, but eventually decided I wanted it on the underside instead. With everything assembled, all that's left to do is wire everything up. I'm using special fiberglass insulated high temperature wire for almost everything. Originally, I added a light switch to allow me to turn things on and off easily, but the surge of power from turning the kiln on the first couple of times as I was experimenting with the wiring burnt it out, so I decided to go without it for now. I'll replace it by the time the video goes up. Here's the wiring diagram for the circuit. Power to run the PID is connected to pins 9 and 10 from a standard 120 volt electrical outlet. The DC voltage to run the relay comes out of pins 6 and 8, so those are connected to the appropriate terminals in the relay. The thermocouple is connected to pins 3 and 4, again making sure to connect the positive and negative to the right side. And that's most of the wiring. That's one of the nice parts about this build. The wiring and operation of the device is very straightforward. To actually run the heating element, I'm using a separate 220 volt power source. Originally, I was using 120 volts, but my wall outlet simply couldn't supply enough current to heat the whole coil, and I could only get the bottom two turns to heat up. So the hot side from the 220 volt power cable gets connected to one terminal of the output side of the relay, and the other hot wire gets connected directly to the top terminal block that the heating coil is connected to. The other terminal of the relay is connected to the bottom terminal block. And that's basically all there is to it. The first time you run the kiln, a large amount of steam will come out. This is all of the excess water that's trapped in the refractory. You shouldn't have issues with explosions because the refractory is so porous that all of the steam can escape without building up pressure. But still be careful and run it low and slowly bake the water out. As more and more of the water escapes, you'll find the kiln working better and better. It's important to be extremely careful when testing this as there's a lot of power going into this device as well as heat, so the risk of burns and electrocution is very real. One way I help to alleviate the risk of electrocution is by making sure everything was properly grounded, by connecting the ground from the power cables directly to the tub. This way, contact with it won't electrocute you, so it's much safer to work with should a short occur. Since I only finished building this a day or two before the video went up, I haven't had a chance to really do anything with it yet other than run some basic functionality tests, but you'll be seeing this kiln a lot more in the future. With it, I can now start to experiment with extremely high temperature chemistries. I've had some great suggestions on different reactions to try out, and will be attempting to make everything from extremely porous carbon nitride, to ultralight carbons, and maybe I'll even try my hand at sintering. I heard that the new blue color Yin Min was made by accident, maybe I can make some on purpose. I've needed a kiln like this to push my research forward for so long, it feels great to finally have a working device. So be sure to check back every Monday to see all the weird and interesting materials and chemistries that I'll be exploring. I didn't get a chance to mention it in the last video, but I'm going to be spending a lot more time on graphic design work. I've mentioned before that I'm working to turn as many of the videos into educational posters as possible, but I'm also starting to work on designs that work better as shirts and other fun items. I just added the first of these to my store on Redbubble. Thanks to Slendy9600 for the suggestion for this adorable superworm saving the world design. It's available on everything from coffee mugs to t-shirts, so if you're looking for something cute and sciencey for the holiday season or just want to support the show, be sure to check the link in the description. I'm going to be trying to add a new item every week or two. If you've got ideas for other designs you'd like to see me make, leave them in the comments and I'll try and bring as many of them to life as possible. Okay guys, that's all I've got for this video. As always, a big thank you to the patrons of the channel who help make these videos possible. I'll be adjusting the rewards again soon to reflect the new merch, so be sure to keep an eye out for that as well. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time for another Mad Science Monday.